then took out those relevant sections. Mr. Packer wrote on the back of that book, the escalating world repression of some hundreds of millions of Christians, which this landmark survey documents thoroughly, is one of the worst evils of our time. For all who care about human rights, human suffering, and helping the needy, Marshall's grim analysis is a must read. Well, one of the greatest repressions perpetrated upon any group of people is the dogmatic false teaching and useless requirements of the Roman Catholic system upon its members. And Mr. Packer, by his endorsement of the ECT document, is guilty of aiding and abetting that unholy system, which is one of the worst evils of our time. Charles Colson says that the most hopeful words from any Christian leader today have come from John Paul II. My oh my, that's our best hope, dear Elvis. I want to say this, if anybody's listening to me today or watching me by video or on audio tape, if you or your church or anybody you know is supporting these men, can I ask you to turn off the tap of support? Because by doing so you are aiding and abetting these men in their compromise and you are doing no favors to the lost Roman Catholic people of this world. The third seed, the third sneeze, if you like, was in 1997 when another document came out from the ECT, people called the Gift of Salvation, and again it was signed and published by so-called evangelical and Roman Catholic leaders. And in this document they sought to persuade us that we really did agree on the matter of justification, that it was really just a misunderstanding of words. And uh, Richard Bennett, who I mentioned earlier, he wrote a very good analysis and he said, this new ecumenical document claims that now both sides agree on what had been the primary dividing point between Protestants and Roman Catholics for several hundred years. And the document states, we agree that justification is not earned by any good works or merits on our own. It is entirely God's gift conferred through the Father's sheer graciousness. Part of the perversion by which the biblical doctrine of justification by faith alone is accomplished in this document is by the use of the Catholic terminology, conferred. Evangelicals are accustomed to the biblical word imputed, as Eric said this morning. For them to agree to the Roman Catholic word conferred, signifying the bringing together of God's grace into the human soul as a quality, is compromise. This teaching of justification being confirmed is the same as that of the Pharisees. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. The statements of this document perpetrate the age-old heresy that justifying righteousness is within man. This audacious statement is 180 degrees contrary to the biblical declaration of imputed righteousness. Their statement is a lie that Rome has always taught from the Council of Trent to the present day. Now so-called evangelicals join them. So friends, those are the seeds of this myth. The publication of Keith Furnier's book back in 1990, the ECT document in 1994, and then the further ECT document in 1997. We need to move on to the spread of the myth in Ireland, and I have 1998 uh, in brackets beside that, but there were a few things happened just before that. In 1991, in May, in Ireland, we were treated to a document called What is an Evangelical Catholic? And then in June of 1992, we got an update, an expanded and enlarged version of that document. What is an evangelical Catholic? And one of the people who helped draft that document was Keith Furnier. So you can see the influence coming across the Atlantic into our own land. Now one of the points that they made in this document was that evangelical Catholics are committed to a respect for and obedience to the teaching authority of the Pope and the bishops of the Catholic Church unless that obedience goes against one's conscience as enlightened by scripture and church teaching. That sounds very fine, but it actually doesn't mean anything. 
Let me go through it again. They have a respect for and obedience to the teaching authority of the Pope and the bishops of the Catholic Church. Well, Rome teaches in the Catechism that only the Pope and the bishops can tell you what the scriptures mean. So these people have a respect for the Pope and the bishops as they teach the scriptures to them. And they will obey that unless that obedience goes against one's conscience as enlightened by scripture and church teaching. So they're going to obey what the people teach unless the teaching enlightens them and then means that they can't obey the teachers. Does that make sense to you? It doesn't make any sense to me. It's a lot of fine sounding words, but it is absolutely meaningless. And of course, they want to confuse you. They want to equivocate, if you like. You see, the reality is you cannot have such a thing as an evangelical Catholic. And uh, it's a contradiction in terms. It's an oxymoron. If these people have a respect for the teaching authority of the Pope and so on, well, this is the catechism that came out in 1994. And the present Pope wrote that in the forward to it. It is a sure norm for teaching the faith. And one would assume that evangelical Catholics accept this. So if I was to be confronted with an evangelical Catholic, I would ask him two questions. I would ask him, do you agree with the teaching of paragraph 1129 of this document? And that teaches that for believers, the sacraments are necessary for salvation. If he believes that, he's a good, sound Roman Catholic, but he's not an evangelical. If he doesn't believe it, he's not a Roman Catholic, and what's more, he's under the anathema of his own church if he does not believe that. So you cannot have it both ways. I would then ask an evangelical Roman Catholic, one who claims to be, do you believe that your justification is preserved and increased through good works? Because that's what the Council of Trent teaches. If he says, yes, I believe that, well, he's a good, sound Roman Catholic, but he's not an evangelical. If he says, no, I don't believe that, you tell him, well, you're not a Roman Catholic, and you're under the anathema of your own church. It is just a contradiction in terms. If someone is a faithful evangelical and a faithful Roman Catholic, you cannot marry the two systems together. When Keith Fournier's book came out in 1990, in a, uh, a newspaper back in the British Isles called Evangelical Times, there was a, an assessment of the book written by a former IRA Catholic terrorist called Michael Cunningham, who blew both his hands off at one stage, and then he was subsequently converted later. And in relation to Keith Fournier's book, he says the terms Evangelical and Roman Catholic are mutually exclusive. And that is an actual Catholic writing that, and he's very true. But we had this 1991-1992 Evangelical Catholic documents coming out, and then they held a conference in 1995. They flew over Father Bob McDougall, Jesuit priest from, based up in uh, Canada, and he went around the place trying to convince us that you could be an evangelical Catholic and so on. And then they, the climax was in July of 1998 when they published a document called Evangelicals and Catholics Together in Ireland. This is the actual booklet, 16-page booklet. J.I. Packard was flown in for meetings in Belfast and in Dublin. Two meetings in Belfast, two in Dublin. I got to the two meetings in Belfast, I got to the evening meeting in Dublin. And on each occasion, after he had said what he had to say, he shared a platform with the Vincentian priest, Father Pat Collins. And they were both pushing this idea. And after each session, there was an opportunity to ask questions. And I availed myself of every opportunity. At the Dublin meeting, uh, I listened to him, and in his conversation, in his talk, he gave a good biblical exposition of justification. I think it was really a, a follow-on from a question I'd asked him the previous night, and he had obviously thought about it, but he, he set out the truth of justification, and then he said this, and I believe that the Catholic signatories to this document are in full agreement with what I've said. So at the end of the talk, I put my hand up, and I got asked, for my question. I said, Dr. Packard, you gave a very good exposition of justification by faith. And you have said that you believe that the Catholic signatories are in agreement with you. I said, looking around this room, I can see a number of them in this room here. Will they now publicly stand up and confirm that they are in agreement with what you have said? 
realizing, of course, two things. If they do, first of all, they come under the anathema of their own church, which would deny what you have taught. And secondly, if they do, you're going to have to retitle your document to Evangelicals and Ex-Catholics Together in Ireland. Well, I waited in vain for anybody to stand up and confirm that they were in agreement with the exposition of justification. So it was rather sad to see a man who had a high reputation going to these lengths to promote the false system of Roman Catholicism. But it is something that he's been doing for quite some time, to be quite honest. It's, it's not really new. Anyhow, what was the framework of this ECT Ireland document? And this is point three of my talk. Well, what they were trying to persuade us was that there was enough common ground that we could recognize each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. And they joyfully affirmed five points that were laid out before us in this document. And this was to be the basis on which we should recognize each other as fellow Christians. The five points were these, and I can tell you they were not the five points of Calvinism. Uh, first of all, you have the sovereignty of the Holy Trinity. Secondly, the abundance of grace. Thirdly, the one holy people. Fourthly, the activity of the Holy Spirit. And fifthly, the authority of Scripture. Now, are these five points from a historic evangelical perspective shared with the teachings of the Roman Catholic religion? Well, let's quickly go through them. First of all, the sovereignty of the Holy Trinity. I think it's quite wrong to assert that the triune God of the Bible and that of Roman Catholicism are one and the same. Rome teaches containing the second person of uh, the Trinity that during Mass, the bread is transubstantiated and becomes the body and blood together with the soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. I don't believe that at all. And I certainly don't believe that he can be offered as a propitiatory sacrifice for the sins of the living and the dead. As Paul wrote that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Sin hath no more dominion over him. Then, of course, is Christ, I keep being told by people, well, the Roman Catholic Christ is the same as your Christ. Well, I've already mentioned that that's not true in that my Christ was born to a woman who was a sinner, whereas the Roman Catholic Christ was born supposedly to a sinless Mary. So what has happened is that attributes and qualities that belong exclusively to Christ have been stripped away from him and given to Mary. Christ has been robbed and Mary has been robed. The Immaculate Conception. The only one who was immaculately conceived was the Lord Jesus Christ himself because he was born of the Holy Spirit and he was holy, he was harmless, he was undefiled, he was separate from sinners. But Rome says, no, Mary was immaculately conceived. The only one who led a sinless life was the Lord Jesus Christ. He knew no sin, did no sin, there was no sin found in him. And Rome says, no, Mary had a sinless life. The only one who offered up that great offering to God for our sins was Christ himself. Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot unto God. But past the twelfth says, no, at Calvary, Mary was offering up her son. I remember being in debate with the Jesuit priest on a televised program. Uh, the debate was, should Mary be declared co-redemptrix? This Jesuit priest was in the throes of explaining to me how there was Mary at Calvary saying, take my son, I offer him up, and I offer myself and my own sufferings, and he was going on about it. And I just asked one question. I said, show me that from the scriptures. And he says, it's not in the scriptures. I said, precisely. He was adding to the word of God. A bit like the Jehovah's Witnesses, they add to the word of God to uh, bolster up their false doctrines. So Christ offered himself, but Rome says no, Mary offered Christ. Christ alone was raised from the dead and taken bodily into heaven, and there he reigns as King of kings and Lord of lords. Past the 12th in 1950 says, no, Mary also was taken up, and there she is seated in heaven as the Queen of heaven. Christ is the one mediator, according to the scriptures. He's the one advocate, according to the scriptures. Paragraph 969 of the Catholic Catechism 
says that Mary has those roles. She's an advocate. She is a mediatrix. But John says, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous. Amen. There's only one righteous person who can be our advocate. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. So the sovereignty of the Holy Trinity, supposedly a point of agreement, is not a point of agreement. The abundance of grace, and uh, again we need to make mention of the fact that terminology is being used, but what do we mean by it? You see, Roman Catholic grace, as I'm sure you all know, is not biblical grace. There was a very good article in the Evangelical Times, that newspaper that I referred to earlier, and it said this, many think of grace as something actually imparted to the believer. That is, they think of it, that is grace, as a gift, when it is in fact the act of giving, an act which in turn reveals the character of the giver. Grace is that which leads God to deal graciously with his people, an attribute of God, rather than something he parts with when he gives. There are those who distort the pivotal truth of what grace really is. They claim that God instills a commodity called grace into people's hearts through various means, rituals, observances, and sacraments. Thus, grace becomes a gift, a reward for man's obedience and good intentions. And by the grace received, they are enabled to please God and earn salvation. People are saved by grace, they declare, but their particular brand of grace is a reward gift its ultimate cause lying in their own actions or works. The grace of which scripture speaks therefore is always and only found in God and emphasizes that salvation is utterly of God's free mercy bestowed on undeserving sinners who were chosen in Christ before time began. Grace describes God in action in the same way that mercy describes God in action. Mercy, when we don't get what we do deserve. Grace when we get what we don't deserve. And what is the result of grace and mercy? Peace. So many times in the New Testament, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father. But Rome has this idea that it's a bit like a new age life force that you need to get infused into you to energize your good works and make them meritorious. Biblical grace is summed up, I believe, in Titus 2.11, where Paul speaks of God giving Christ in these terms. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. And that's why he speaks of his ministry to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And in his first letter to the Corinthians, the message of his ministry was condensed into two phrases. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. For Paul, the grace of God was summed up in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave, he offered up, delivered up for sacrifice, his only begotten son. <clears throat> so God's grace speaks of him actually sending his son to save sinners, not to earn something called grace which people then tap into via the sacraments in order to perform works which will merit their salvation. It is claimed by Rome that there is an abundance of this grace and that it is dispensed by them. They're a bit like a spiritual chemist, you know, where you need to solve the sin problem. Well, you go along and you get a, a prescription filled via the sacraments and that'll do you for a while and then you have to go back and get another and another and so on and so forth. That is not biblical grace. Let's move on quickly. One holy people. Well, <laughs> they may claim to be the one holy people, but they're in, not in agreement as to how you enter into this body of the one holy people. We've already seen that they sanction evangelical spirit regeneration, or they sanction baptismal regeneration. Uh, at the start of this evangelical booklet, they uh, claim about how many Christians there are in the world, and they include Roman Catholics. And they say, in many countries, including our own, the scandal of conflict between them obscures the scandal of the cross. And they give 1 Corinthians 1.23 as their justification for using the expression, the scandal of the cross. Well, 1 Corinthians 1.23 talks about the cross being foolishness to the Greeks and a stumbling block to the Jews, but it doesn't talk about the scandal. And in fact, verse 24, it speaks of the cross as the power and wisdom of God. So that is very loose language by them. Yes. 
But then they say uh, that because of these conflicts, it is crippling the one mission of the one Christ. So they believe that we're all really together in the one mission. Even despite our differences, we are really the same Christians at heart, and we have one mission. Well, I thought about that. And I thought, well, say you were looking at two newborns, and you discover that one is white and one is black. One has a tail, one has no tail. One has four legs, one has two legs. One has no hands, one has two hands. One is a puppy, one is a baby. But despite all of these differences, they are actually twins who have one mission in life. <laughs> well, that's what the, this document is telling us. In spite of all of these differences, and they do actually list a whole lot of differences in this document, which they agree that they haven't got answers to at this point. Uh, whether the church is a part of the gospel or it's a, a consequence of the gospel. Whether scripture is interpreted by the church or the authority is sola scriptura. Uh, and they mentioned baptism, whether it's uh, actually regeneration or whether it's a testimony to salvation. So they diagnose all of the, the difficulties and the differences, but in spite of them all, they said, well, we're still Christians together with the one mission. So they claim to be the one holy people. They claim that there's agreement on the activity of the Holy Spirit. Absolutely not. John chapter 3 says the Holy Spirit operates like the wind. And who can control the wind? God sovereignly controls the activity of the Holy Spirit. But Rome says no, and the priest, if his intentions are right and so on, when he baptizes the baby, you can take it for granted that definitely that child is going to be regenerated, sin washed away, and it's made a member of the one true church. So in reality, Rome believes that it can control the activity of the Holy Spirit, whereas the scripture says that the Holy Spirit is sovereign. Uh, man in the physical realm can induce birth, bring it on, but we cannot do it in the spiritual realm. Only God can bring new birth to pass. The authority of Scripture, they say we joyfully affirm together that the divinely inspired Scriptures are the infallible and authoritative Word of God. Well, I've already mentioned that that's only a half truth, because Rome says, of course, that tradition is also, along with the Word of God, a single deposit. And of course, hovering over all of them is the magisterium, who tell you what the scriptures mean and who tell you what tradition is. So the ultimate authority, in fact, is the magisterium. They say it's like a three-legged stool, you know, and if one leg goes, it'll fall apart. That's not true. As long as they have the magisterium with the bishops and the pope, they can still rule the roast and so on. This document is full of equivocation, using language which at first glance, if you take a meaning out of it, you, you think is biblical, but that's not actually what's intended, well then that's your fault. And on the drafting committee of this ECT Ireland, there was a Jesuit, so I'm not surprised to see such things happening. One other point, and I'll come quickly to an end shortly. They said under a heading, we repent together. They said, as we look back on our common Christian witness over the past 2,000 years, we repent of the grievous mistakes of the past and of the atrocities committed in the name of Christ against non-Christian groups. The genocidal Christian persecution of the Jews during the Crusades, the Spanish Inquisition, and more recently, the Holocaust. In addition, we acknowledge the pain and hurt caused to the Muslim world during the Crusades. So they were saying that it was genuine Christians who perpetrated all of those atrocities. No evangelical in their right mind should have had anything to do with such a document which maligned the true witness of the true church down through the years. That was the framework of the myth. And finally, just the fruit of the myth, and I'll go to it very quickly. As a result of these documents, Roman Catholicism has been validated in the eyes of many, many people. The reality is that Roman Catholicism is the modern day equivalent of the Judaizers. And a very good book, Salvation, the Bible and Roman Catholicism by former Catholic Bill Webster, he documents that so well. Well, Rome asked for many more requirements than the Judaizers ever did. 
But you know, there are people in our world, and particularly over in my part of the world, who are standing the teaching of Paul's letter to the Galatians in relation to this matter on its head. The problem in Galatia was twofold. There was the spreading of false teaching by the Judaizers, and there was the siding with false teachers, which is what Peter was doing. Well, today, the spreading of false teaching, today you have Rome. The siding with false teachers, today you have the ecumenists. In the first case, regarding the false teaching, Paul anathematized it. In the second case, he publicly challenged it. But you know, this book, Adventures in Reconciliation, 29 Catholic Testimonies, it came out at the time that Dr. Packer was in Ireland, and he said we should get it. It's a great book and all the rest of it. It's a very sad book. Roman Catholics giving their testimony. I don't believe from reading this that any of them have come to a true saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the forward of it, you had leading ecumenical Protestant ministers endorsing it. One of them is called the Reverend Trevor Morrow, Presbyterian minister. Sadly, he has just been inducted as the moderator of the Presbyterian Church in Ireland for the next 12 months. The outgoing moderator was a good godly man, Reverend John Lockington, but his successor, I'm afraid, is very far removed from him. And in the forward, listen to what he wrote, and bear in mind the letter to the Galatians and so on. This is what Trevor Morrow wrote. In Paul's letter to the Galatians, the Jewish Christians from Jerusalem had come down to Galatia and were fearful that Paul's message of justification, apart from the work of the law, would undermine the traditions and identity of their Jewish inheritance. They were insisting that it was not enough for a Gentile to believe in Jesus Christ. They also had to follow the laws of Judaism, to be circumcised, to keep the dietary requirements, to observe the Jewish Sabbaths and festivals in order for them to be accepted as Christians. It became for them a criteria for fellowship. Paul rails against this if someone insists that something else is required apart from faith in order to accept a person as a fellow Christian or as a basis for fellowship, then they, says Paul, are preaching a false gospel. The Judaizers were not insisting on all of those things as a criteria for fellowship, as a criteria for accepting someone as a Christian. They were listing all of those things as a criteria for salvation. But what has happened here is that we who are siding with Paul, we're being labeled as the bad guys. Because we're saying that people don't, you know, shouldn't stay within a system that has all of these Judaistic requirements. And that you shouldn't fellowship with a system that has all of these Judaistic requirements. We're being labeled as the bad guys. Yet in his day, Paul challenged those who spread the false gospel, the Judaizers. And today we challenge Rome. He publicly challenged Peter for siding with them. And today we should publicly challenge the ecumenists. I mentioned just Alpha Course. You may not have heard of it. It's a Bible course spread by a charismatic Anglican church in London. It's going around the world, and people are going to it, flocking to it. Can I tell you that Rome has formally endorsed it? So if Rome has endorsed it, it's not worth the paper that it's written on. That's the simple matter. And it encourages people to go into Toronto blessing style experiences, and it encourages them to be involved in ecumenism. I close with this. Dialoguing with people can be dangerous and deadly. You only have to look at Abel's fate after he dialogued with Cain. And evangelicals are being encouraged to sit down and to dialogue with Roman Catholics rather than preaching the gospel to them. Reminds me of a story, and I'll finish with this. I heard it on the radio during my time in America. It's the story of the hunter and the bear. The hunter was about to shoot this bear, and the bear said over to him, Tell me, what do you really want? So the hunter says, I want a fur coat. Okay, you want a fur coat. I want a full stomach. Could we not just sit down and talk about this? So they did. Five minutes later, the bear walked away with a full stomach, and the hunter had a fur coat. <laughs> and friends, if we sit down and dialogue, that is exactly what is going to happen to the gospel. It is going to be swallowed up by the bear of Roman Catholicism.
Uh, God will bless what we have listened to this afternoon and may use it indeed to help us as we seek to evangelize the lost in Roman Catholicism. Let's just close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time that we have spent together. We thank you for your precious word, which is a lamp onto our feet and a light onto our path. And you encourage us to test the spirits, whether they be of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And so, Father, we pray that you would use this information that has been shared today. Use it that we might indeed be able to truly reach those who are lost in the system of Roman Catholicism. We do this out of a love for their souls. And pray, Father, that you will help us. For we ask it in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Thank you. I'd like to